Okay. So with that, we're going to see here, switch over to the next talk, uh, which is uh, going to be uh, Ben Bussey and Jake Bleacher um, uh, uh, describing the long-awaited science objectives for the Artemis program. Okay, Jake and Ben, take it away. Great. Um, yes, thank you, Sam. So yes, Jake and I will be giving you a presentation on the Artemis science plan. And I think the key thing to start with is if, this is not to say that this plan is finished. Um, we were, a few of us were tasked with, come, we, were, we, were, we were being asked, what science would you try and achieve with the crew on the moon? And in fact, this workshop is a key part of that, of, of answering that question. And so what we're going to present to you today is uh, our, the attempt by um, a small group to sort of capture what we feel the community have been talking about over multiple years. Uh, and I think this workshop and the following ones will fine tune that and give, you will get good feedback and this will grow into being what the science that the crews will do. Um, I will give an overview sort of on the science side and then Jake is going to sh show how HEO are taking those science objectives and that's feeding into um, developing requirements at the, the, of capabilities that the crew need on the surface. Thank you. Next slide, please. Okay. So very high level, you know, the moon enables scientific exploration. It really is um, a cornerstone for solar system science and exoplanet studies. It's a national laboratory to study planetary processes and evolution. And also from an exploration sense, it's a training ground to learn how to efficiently conduct scientific exploration on a, on a planetary surface uh, together with crew and robotic explorers. And finally, it's an opportunity to do, uh, to use the infrastructure and resources associated with human exploration um, to enable, uh, enable science, science to be done. Next slide. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, this is this is you know lots of people have thought about this for it you know for at least the last sixty years, and there are lots of community documents out there, both uh, international and U.S. documents. And as you read through them, what we did is we we think these six themes sort of capture the science that we will be able to do by having crews on the moon. There's study of planetary processes understanding volatile cycles, the impact history of the Earth moon system, a record of the ancient sun, fundamental lunar science, and a platform to study the universe. And I'm going to go through each of these very briefly. Uh, I won't talk the whole slides, just to sort of set the stage of, of reviewing what those documents have, have said. Next slide. So study of planetary processes. This is really the case of the moon as a mini planet and it's experienced many of the processes that we want to understand uh, in, in order to get in order to um, we want to study to better understand how the terrestrial planets formed and evolved this is differentiation impacts volatiles volcanism and tectonism next slide the understanding of the volatile cycles of the moon uh, is really key um, the moon contains uh, evidence for a diversity of sources and sinks. There are set, we, you know, the general belief is that there are several different uh, vo volatile cycles on the moon. Uh, everything from water delivered from comets and asteroids, um, uh, water being made in situ by solar wind, etc., interacting with the surface, um, as also potential for the water that formed inside the moon when the moon formed, eventually reaching its way out to the surface. Next slide. So you have the impact history of the Earth moon system. Um, you'll see that the moon and Earth are in the, roughly the same point in the solar system, so have had a similar impact flux. Um, whereas the craters on the Earth are, er uh, are, are, are eroded, their record has been eroded. We can actually study that impact record over the last 4.6 billion years by studying the moon. Um, one of the, you know, we want to, uh, key things to, the, understanding the impact flux is also a way to do um, chronology throughout the solar system. And we also want to understand how, um, how episodic the impacts have been uh, in the Earth moon system, which have impacts for how life has evolved on Earth. Next slide. 
Um, similar to retaining the history of the impact flux, we also can study a record of the ancient sun. And the moon surface has been bathed in solar wind and cosmic rays for um, four and a half billion years. And the dust grains retain some of this information. Um, both buried regolith from impacts as also regolith trapped between lava flows um, could retain this historical record of these fluxes. And so very careful excavation and study once we have crews on the surface uh, will help us to understand how the sun has changed through time. Next slide, please. Um, a, bloody, uh, a platform to study the universe. So the lack of atmosphere allows the full electromagnetic spectrum to be studied from the uh, surface. Also, the far side of the moon is the only known place in the solar system which is permanently shielded from Earth's radio noise, uh, allowing us to, to detect much, be, have much more sensitive instruments than we can do on Earth, which essentially lets you look back further in time closer to the Big Bang. Uh, astronomy also is one of the class of sort of op uh, opportunistic science, which is that it may, the lunar surface may not be your first choice as a location to do the astronomy that you want to do. But once we start to have resources associated with human exploration, potentially you could leverage those resources to, um, to do good science. Next slide. And then we have fundamental lunar science. So this is taking advantage of a fractional gravity, dusty vacuum environment uh, to study a wealth of topics. You have life sciences, combined effects of fractional gravity with the deep space radiation. It's obviously something very important as we want to do sustainable lunar exploration as well as exploration further afield. There's exploration physics, combustion, fluid dynamics, etc. Uh, fundamental physics, uh, general relativity, gravitational physics, um, quantum informational science. And also from a human exploration side, we are interested in food and drug degradation. Again, as we go to Mars or further afield, we need to learn how the nutritional value of food um, or how well drugs work um, changes as they're exposed to a deep space environment. Next slide. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Jake, who's going to talk about the human, uh, human health and performance and also how some of the science we've, I've talked to you about so far um, feeds into uh, what HEO is trying to do with crew. Yeah, thank you, Ben. Uh, so in addition to the science that you would typically um, look to SMD for completing, uh, we are also thinking about how do we maintain sustainable human exploration in the solar system? And so in the human research program on the HEO side of this, we're really thinking about how to retire risks or at least mitigate risks so that we can establish that sustainable human exploration path. And so that really is thought of more as a spectrum, including activities here on Earth to prepare using our platforms in low Earth orbit, absolutely using the lunar system. And we have already collected data from Apollo about crews going to the moon, being in lunar orbit, uh, transferring from Earth orbit to lunar orbit. So that serves as a basis for us. And again, as Marshall, Steve, and others mentioned this morning, uh, we'll have platforms in orbit around the moon. We'll have assets on the surface of the moon. Uh, and they give us the opportunity to start thinking about how to deal with risks uh, that we'll need to face as we explore farther out into the solar system and continue activities on the lunar surface. Uh, so you can largely break this down into five hazards that we would face for humans exploring the solar system. We have to think about the impact of isolation and confinement on our crews as they travel to some of these distant locations. And in fact, distance itself from the Earth is another impact that we have to think about on our, on our crew. Uh, as you explore these destinations, our crews are going to experience changes in gravity, going from Earth gravity uh, to microgravity to no gravity, back to gravity wells, depending on the destination. And that's something that we need to start thinking about and uh, beginning to uh, identify how to mitigate those risks as we move forward. Uh, we also have to understand how to deal with the radiation environment. And these are obvious. Uh, locations where we cross over with the SMD science, understanding solar activity. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, a really good question about the first payloads flying on Gateway. Uh, again, one of the reasons that 
those initial payloads were selected was because they were deemed to be of value to uh, to all the agencies as well as to um, multiple disciplines. And so understanding that radiation environment at Gateway, understanding it more clearly at the lunar surface is all part of understanding that risk. And then just dealing with uh, the hostile closed environments that we're going to face uh, out in deep space, on the lunar surface, transit to Mars, and eventually the surface of Mars itself. Next slide, please. And as we talk about this now, we have the science uh, being provided from the SMD side, the science that we're dealing with, um, thinking about um, mitigating risks on the HEO side. Um, a few more slides here we want to walk through, but I just wanted to point out that um, this activity of trying to get this information pulled together and consolidated, um, it, it basically it started with a request from HEO that we, we placed uh, with SMD uh, because we really needed to pull um, this information together so that there's some traceability for the requirements on the hardware we're developing on the HEO side. Uh, we, at the most kind of basic level, our job is to get the crew to the moon. Um, they can go on the human landing system. They may be going through the gateway. Uh, they'll be operating on the surface. Um, but we want to know what do we need of these systems in, in order for us to address the goals that NASA, the external NASA community, our international communities are going to want to achieve. You know, why is it that we're going to the moon? And we've seen the conversations on the lunar list. We've seen conversations um, on the international documents. And that's what Ben was talking about early on is that this wasn't a group, uh, a small group of people at NASA headquarters making this up. It was really just us pulling together the discussions that you all have had over the last several decades. So none of this should really be that new to anybody. Uh, but then we start driving from those goals into what does that mean for the systems we're building? Uh, in order to do some of the activities that, uh, that Ben and I have mentioned, you know, we're really looking at surface science on, on the moon. Um, there are aspects of this that will most likely require significant mobility. Um, if we just land and walk around a little bit near the lander, the likelihood we're going to be exposed to diverse terrains, different units, uh, pieces of information about the history of the solar system, the Earth-Moon system, uh, it, that's minimized if we can't move around. It also requires us to be there for increasingly longer periods of time to conduct the science that we need to, uh, need to address. And I want to make the point here about um, human robotic partnership. Actually, can I just get a comm check? My phone just did a quick little thing. I'm not sure. We still have you. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so I just want to make a point here. Most of our um, initial speakers spoke about this, the human robotic partnership. This is something that's going to include the human crews, but it's also going to include robotic activities, some while the crew are there and sometimes when the crew are not. So really understanding what we need of those systems is, is going to be important. Bringing back critical samples. Uh, we have to design the systems so that we can get that material back to the Earth. We brought a lot of uh, amazing samples back from Apollo, and as Steve and Sarah have talked about, we're, some of them we're just opening up now to uh, reveal the secrets that they hold. Um, but we want to bring more back, and that's, that's another um, impact on the systems that we're designing. Uh, you heard Sarah talking about the types of instruments and understanding what instruments we're going to want uh, to send to the surface to, to address those goals. Um, access to cold regions. If we are serious about trying to understand these volatile cycles, in some cases that's going to require um, activities that take us into cold areas. And so the systems we're developing are going to need to be able to do that for us. Uh, next slide, please. And so again, pulling these together, helping us really drive towards the requirement that we'll need on the, uh, on the systems that he are developing. That's really what was the root of this discussion. Um, so again, we kind of tried to summarize it here, and uh, I will remind everyone what Ben already said. This is a starting point. This is a, an initiation of this, uh, and we hope to have this as an ongoing conversation through these types of workshops moving forward. You know, but studying planetary processes, having mobility to get to different areas, um, uh, suits and vehicles that can accommodate that for us. Um, getting to the, those critical locations to understand the volatile cycles. That addresses both how we collect samples as well as what types of um, environments we can operate in. Um, a lot of these um, require different types of tools for sample collection. 
Uh, we talked about, um, or Ben talked about, understanding uh, the solar history. Uh, well, in some cases, we then want to collect regolith in certain ways that keeps it undisturbed to have the maximum uh, value in that sample that we're bringing home. And that all drives towards how we build the tools that we want to take there. Uh, looking out at the universe from the surface of the moon, um, we're going to need to figure out where and how to place that type of instrumentation. And again, this may include um, the dexterity that a human brings to the surface. It could be done robotically. It may be a partnership. Perhaps robotics uh, gets the, the payloads in place and it still needs some interaction with the crew members. Um, and again, then understanding um, the lunar environment impact on some of those uh, materials that we're going to need. How long can we keep um, the pharmaceuticals there? Or do they have a life cycle that's different on the lunar surface in that radiation environment? Um, so we're going to need the down mass to be able to get these experiments in place and conduct those activities while we're there. Next slide, please. So this is the list uh, that Ben has walked through largely and, um, and some of the inputs on the HEO side. Um, and again, we're keeping this intentionally at a high level here. Um, often we don't need to dig down to the individual experiment level of discussion to uh, have uh, good input towards how we develop the system. But that's the discussion that we want to see happening starting now and moving through the next few years as we work towards landing on the surface of the moon. Getting that down there to the um, experiment level, and that will help us with planning the activities for individual landed missions and what it is that we're doing on the surface, taking advantage of some of those assets that Lindsay talked about um, a little bit ago. Uh, so I think we'll just leave that slide up here um, and, uh, and I'll hand it back to Sam. And I think we can answer some questions on this talk specifically, Ben and I, or we can uh, move into the discussion as well. Thank you. Oh, cool, thank you, Jake. Really appreciate it, that's very helpful.